for organising this event and um, making sure that we got sufficiently publicised for you to turn up. I was pleased to see that you were here. Uh, so um, thanks Liam, thanks uh, Zach, and thanks uh, to the others who are involved in this. Uh, I do want to talk uh, particularly about Animal Liberation Now, my most recent book, and in one sense this is the culminating event of a world tour because I've been talking about the book since uh, it was published in, um, towards the end of, of May in the United States. Um, traveled through several cities in the United States talking about it, went to talk about it in London, and I've also spoken in Perth and Adelaide uh, about here, and this is uh, really the last, the last of these events. Uh, so it is though um, also an effective altruism event, and I will be saying a little bit about the relevance and the connection between effective altruism and what I'm talking about in terms of concern to reduce animal suffering. So let's, uh, let's start, I hope. Mm. So the technical problem is it's not good. <laughs> Does not seem to be working. Um, can I do it like this? Okay. You may need some help here. Um, yes. Well done. Great. All right. So, what you're looking at here is something that I think. Um, everybody in this audience, whether they've got a connection with the animal movement or not, is going to find very disturbing, not shocking. Uh, these are dogs who have been rounded up, captured, and they are going to be sold for meat, uh, as happens in a couple of countries in the world. Of course, not here. And that's why perhaps we do find it shocking that dogs should be treated in this way and should be killed uh, for me. But this is something that is a more familiar sight in Australia. These are pigs who are also uh, being taken to be killed for meat. And this is something that if you travel on country roads in Australia, you're quite likely to see, maybe with pigs, maybe with cows, maybe with sheep. Um, but it's something that has become a sort of everyday sight and we don't find so disturbing. And that is an example of what I want to talk about and what is fundamental to the ideas of animal liberation. A bias in favour of some species and against others. And that's what I think is questionable and I want us to reflect on that and agree that this is not something that we should be supporting. Now of course the biggest bias in favour of species is not the bias between dogs and pigs, although that's a, a good example of it, but between ourselves, humans, members of the species Homo sapiens and other non-human animals. So I refer to this as speciesism. Uh, it's not a term I invented. I owe it to Richard Ryder, who was somebody who I knew in Oxford when I was a graduate student back in the early 1970s. Uh, and he produced, he was particularly opposed to the use of animals in experiments, and he produced a, uh, a one page leaflet that I saw, which had a picture of a chimpanzee who had been infected with syphilis and was looking very miserable. Um, Chimpanzees don't get syphilis, so it's possible to infect them with it. Uh, and this chimpanzee was being used as a research uh, animal for um, treating syphilis in humans. And it had this sing single word across the top of it, speciesism, which immediately struck me as making the parallel between something that I have long rejected, namely racism, and perhaps not so long, but increasingly had rejected, and that's sexism, the movement for women's liberation, as it was then known, or feminism, uh, had begun some years earlier and achieved wide support. But speciesism, 
are we also wrong to think that our species is more important, has a higher moral status than beings of other species? That's what I want to argue, um, and particularly notice in this uh, slide the word merely up here, right? So to reject speciesism is not to say that differences which are obvious between human beings and at least the non-human animals we are familiar with who exist on this planet. Um, there are such differences. No non-human animal would understand what I'm saying to you now, as I hope you're all understanding. Um, so that's a significant difference, and there are others. But the idea that merely because you're a member of the species Homo sapiens, therefore you have a higher moral status, you have more importance, your interests count for more than members of other species, that's what I think we should reject, as we should reject the idea that being of a particular race or sex also gives you a higher moral status or more significance than others who are not of that race or sex. So, um, I think the mainstream attitude that we have today in society still, and I say this with regret because it's, uh, it is 50 years since I first wrote about this, it's 48 years since I published Animal Liberation, but I wrote an article two years earlier which made this point, so it is uh, this year 50 years since um, I've been writing this, um, but it's still the case that we have this bias. And although you could say our attitudes to animals have improved somewhat over that period, and certainly they've improved more if you go back uh, to uh, centuries earlier, um, it's still true that the attitudes we have are species. And while we might say, as I quote here, these are, these are quotes from sort of mainstream ideas, that we ought to be kind to animals, we ought not to be cruel to them, in particular wanton cruelty, that is cruelty serves no purpose, like somebody enjoying making an animal suffer, um, or somebody hitting an animal for the fun of it because they have power over it, we all reject that. But um, the idea that uh, there are human rights which apply only to humans, to all humans, but only to humans, um, is a speciesist idea, I believe, and um, this idea down the bottom that animal interests count but may always be overridden by human interests, even relatively minor ones, I think that underlies many of the things that we do to animals today which we ought not to be doing to them today. So, um, why are those animals, why are those attitudes species? Now, you might say, as I've already suggested, well, humans are different in various ways. And this lists some of the differences that people will come up with if you challenge the idea that humans have a higher moral status. They will say, but humans are rational, self-aware, autonomous, moral agents, language users. And if you've done a bit of philosophy, you might say, well, humans can take part in a social contract, that is, they can accept that they ought not to do bad things to others and in return they expect others not to do bad things <coughs> to them. And no, only humans can do that. And to some extent that's true. I mean, maybe there are some animals who do understand that if you're kind to them, they're not going to be uh, not be bad to you, but a lot of them obviously are not. Um, no matter how kind to animals you might be, um, if you're unlucky enough to be in, a, in the water with a shark, um, the shark is just as likely to attack you as it's likely to attack somebody who's spent their lives mistreating animals. So um, these, these differences are differences that separate most humans from non-human animals. But clearly not all humans, none of us were born with the, any of these qualities. Um, and some of us, some humans, still may not have all of those qualities, or perhaps not even any of them. But um, nevertheless, the idea that 
all humans have rights and all humans ought to be treated in a certain way um, is still quite prevalent and is accepted in law as well. It was challenged by Jeremy Bentham, shown here, who is the founder of the Philosophical Radicals, as they were sometimes called, or of the School of English Utilitarians. Um, and Bentham, as well as being a reformer on a wide range of issues, uh, well known for prison reform, uh, well known for uh, electoral reform, the Philosophical Radicals were strong advocates of um, universal male suffrage anyway, at the time when the franchise was limited to uh, wealthy property owners, um, the philosophical radicals were uh, advocating universal male suffrage. And uh, in fact, Bentham's uh, godson, John Stuart Mill, who was also um, an English utilitarian, was the first to move in Parliament an amendment to the universal franchise which would, would replace the word man by person thus enfranchising women. Uh, he did that, I think, in the 80, early 1870s, um, and he knew that he wasn't going to carry that motion, but um, uh, he was the first to actually move for uh, franchise to include women, and it took another 50 years or so for the United Kingdom to achieve that. Um, but it's in accordance with their principles, and in fact, in Bentham's writings as well, you can find um, uh, a statement that uh, really there was no reason for restricting the franchise to men, but uh, that was a difficult enough ask at the time anyway, and if you'd include women, you would have had no chance of moving forward. So it was kind of a pragmatic compromise at that stage. So um, Bentham's point about animals, which is not some, one of his major interests, but you find it in an important footnote to this uh, early later, uh, work of the late 18th century, is he says, the question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? So that's essentially his response to the points I put up in the previous slide. That um, in terms of how we ought to treat beings, in terms of whether they come within the sphere of morality and whether their interests matter, the really <laughs> decisive question <laughs> is can they suffer? Because if they can suffer, then they have interests, and then those interests should count. We have no justification for excluding them simply on the basis that they lack these other characteristics. Okay, so having raised the question, can they suffer, let me very briefly ask, uh, discuss that question because some people might have skepticism about animal suffering but, or about how wide that is going to extend. So in terms of how do we know animals suffer, I don't think many people would doubt that, non, that there are many non-human animals who can suffer. And that's based on these three factors, uh, that very often their anatomy and physiology is similar to ours. I think that's true of vertebrates generally, that there are parallels and similarities there in terms of how the nervous system operates, in terms of having a central brain, um, there are parallels with their behavior in appropriate circumstances. If we do things that would hurt us, um, then we react in a certain way and we can observe somewhat similar reactions uh, from non-human animals. And of course, uh, they have a shared evolutionary history. So we can um, assume that the parallels in behavior and in anatomy and physiology actually are related to a similar function namely to warn the organism of a threat or danger and that it's desirable to move away from. And if you didn't have that capacity to sense pain, you would have been less likely to survive uh, and be able to reproduce. So I think this is very clear for uh, vertebrate animals. Um, and so for these first two categories that I have here on this slide, animals and birds and indeed all vertebrates, uh, I think it's very clear that they can suffer. But it's interesting, and it's one of the differences, I think, between when I wrote Animal Liberation uh, nearly 50 years ago and today, that I think we can have more confidence about some invertebrates as well, because a lot more research has been done on uh, invertebrates than was done 50 years ago. And it's interesting that um, quite recently, 
the United Kingdom has uh, legislated um, that uh, some invertebrates count as sentient beings. So the, the reason why um, this came up is that, as you will recall, um, the United Kingdom not long ago left the European Union. The European Union has as part of its basic platform, basic, basic law, the fact that animals have the status of sentient being, which is not the same as the status of a person, but it's different from the status of a thing. So in some sense in the European Union, animals are not merely things, they're not merely property, they're sentient beings. Now, when uh, Boris Johnson as Prime Minister um, uh, led Europe out of the European Union and sought support for that, um, there was opposition from some people in the animal welfare movement who said, if we leave the European Union, animals won't have the legal status of sentient beings. And Johnson said, don't worry, we'll legislate to give them the status of sentient beings. And that actually is a promise that he kept. Um, he did introduce legislation uh, to give animals the status of sentient beings. But as it was going through Parliament, um, the House, uh, some uh, members of the House of Lords raised the question, well, which animals? And um, they uh, looked at a report that had been done on um, two categories of invertebrates, uh, cephalopods, cephalopods are octopus and squid in particular, um, and uh, a group of crustaceans called decapod crustaceans. Decapod means uh, 10 feet, 10 legs. Um, and decapod crustaceans include lobsters and crabs. So um, the peers were convinced by this report and they amended the legislation as it was going through to include cephalopods and decapod crustaceans. And uh, they are now protected in the United Kingdom and in a couple of other countries. So uh, I think that's uh, important progress to recognize even in invertebrates, although the evolutionary distance from us is much greater, the anatomy and physiology is somewhat different, but we can still get evidence from their behavior and from what's going on that indeed they are capable of feeling pain uh, and they are conscious beings. But I don't think it's necessarily the case that all of those beings we call animals uh, conscious beings. So if you come in here, I'm uh, agnostic about insects um, and other crustaceans other than the decapods. Uh, agnostic partly because we don't really know, there just isn't the research that's been done. Um, and of course, these are hugely wide categories of beings. We talk about insects. It's a vast number of species, huge differences between them. No reason why it should be the case that they are either all sentient or non-sentient. There may well be differences between bees, let's say, who do seem to behave with certain kinds of intelligence and communicate to each other the source and uh, distance and direction of, of sources of pollen. Uh, that might be very different from mealworms, perhaps, um, who may not have those capacities. Uh, and, and if we talk about mollusks, then uh, cephalopods, like octopus, are mollusks, but so too are bivalves. Um, and we may question whether bivalves are sentient beings. Um, and even among bivalves, there might be differences between clams and oysters. So I, th I, I think if you take a, a, a bivalve like an oyster, uh, which doesn't really move, an oyster attaches itself to a rock at a fairly early stage um, and, and doesn't move thereafter. So would it have evolved a capacity to feel pain? Uh, well, it wouldn't serve very much purpose as it can't move away from the source of pain. And when you look at the nervous system, it's very simple. So you know, maybe, maybe oysters are not capable of, of feeling pain. So I'm not committed to the view that all animals as such are sentient beings or have the same moral status as sentient beings, but uh, I think a large number of them do. And if possible, we should give others the benefit of the doubt where we don't really know one way or the other. OK, so this is the view that I think we ought to reject in particular. This is what I call anthropocentric speciesism. As I said at the beginning, it's the most important one. The idea that our interests matter more than the similar interests of any non-human animal. 
And I stress here similar interests to make it clear that I'm not saying that all animals have, have interests that are like ours, but there are some that are like ours and there's no reason to discount them. So if, if an animal is capable of feeling physical pain as we are, then uh, that capacity for pain and the pain that is experienced should count just as much as a similar amount of pain experienced by a human being, let's say if you like by a baby to avoid some of the complications about um, uh, you know, self-awareness of the pain. Um, but it shouldn't matter just as much that uh, a cow or a pig or a dog is suffering a certain amount of pain as that a baby is suffering a certain amount of pain. And we shouldn't be saying, well, one is human and the other is not, so it's the human's pain that matters more. If pain is pain, whatever the species of the being who uh, experiences it. Um, and of course, this is what I started with, the species bias. We should also reject the idea that the interests of animals we like, such as the dogs or cats we have as companion animals, matter more than the interests of animals we find less attractive, whatever those animals might be. And this is where I come to effective altruism in the animal movement, because unfortunately if you look at where people donate to animal welfare issues, um, it is not on the basis of how can we be most effective in reducing animal suffering. So if you look at these two boxes here, which come from a United States study, but are probably not all that different here in Australia. Um, so the box on the left is um, the number of animals killed or used. Um, and uh, as you can see, this is absolutely overwhelmingly uh, farmed animals. Uh, you can hardly see, you can, you can see the, the, the animals used in research, the lab animals, this orange color, you can probably see that, it's very small compared to the farm animals, but um, you can hardly see over here a little stripe for the shelters, that is the dogs and cats stuck in, in shelters, stray animals, and those used for clothing, whether it's, it's fur or wool, that's uh, also a tiny number. And then you come over here and you look at where does the money go that is donated to animal charities. Um, and this majority of the money is going to the animals in shelters that you can barely see on this box. Um, and then there's this large, fairly large category of others, a lot of which would be iconic wild animals uh, or endangered uh, wild animals, and uh, a relatively small amount of farmed animals um, and a more proportion perhaps a map for the bioframe. So um, if we want to reduce animal suffering and if we don't have a bias particularly towards dogs and cats as I'd argue we shouldn't, then we need to try to change this. Um, we need to try to get more resources going towards uh, animals and farms um, rather than going towards uh, a much smaller number of dogs and cats in shelters or strays. Um, and of course, you know, their suffering matters, it's important, but um, by and large, uh, dogs and cats have much better lives than farmed animals, and uh, as I say, the numbers are much smaller. So if you're an effective altruist, if that's uh, you're part of that group, and you have a concern for animals, as I argue you should, then uh, you should be thinking largely about farmed animals. Okay, so what should we say instead of the species' bias towards um, uh, humans and to some extent towards dogs and cats? Um, we should, I think, be defending this principle of equal consideration of interests, or more precisely, as I said, equal consideration of similar interests, to give um, equal weight to those similar interests irrespective of species. Um, and as I've said, we can accept that animals have different interests. Um, this is a photo of some uh, cows being raised for uh, beef in an organic farm not far from Princeton. And at least at this stage of their life, they have their, their needs are satisfied. Um, so they, as you can see, the, the cows are with their mothers. They're in a small social group that is suitable for their species. They have plenty of food. Um, there are no predators that are really 
threats to them. Um, so at least at that stage, um, their interests are satisfied. Uh, human interests are not satisfied by simply having enough to eat and being in a social group with, with its natural fuel species. Um, at least in, in the modern world, uh, you have an interest in getting an education, you have an interest in expanding your, your knowledge, uh, and I hope in contributing to making the world a better place. So some people might debate uh, whether that is a basic human interest. Um, so, uh, yes, we may have longer term interests um, than non-human animals. We may want to know more about our future. Uh, these cows don't, which is fortunate for them. But um, uh, I'm not denying that there are different interests and that sometimes you can't say that interests are the same. So it doesn't follow from rejecting speciesism that um, killing a non-human animal is the same as killing a human being. Uh, some of the differences in terms of the suffering that may occur and uh, in particular the concern that may occur among others who are not the one who is the victim of the killing, uh, I think are relevant to how seriously we ought to judge that. But um, uh, that doesn't, that's not a reason for rejecting the principle of equal consideration for similar interests. And if we look at that, let's look briefly at some of these consequences uh, of the species of practice that we have, then as I've said, um, uh, farm animals is an area that's really important and the one that I want to focus on is, is because of the, the vast numbers. So, um, as you saw on that previous chart, the second largest area of um, animal abuse was the use of animals in research. And worldwide, we might make an estimate that around 200 million animals are uh, used and killed annually in research. Um, that's an estimate because uh, we don't have good statistics from uh, all countries, and include, that includes the United States where the guesses as to how many animals are used in research in the United States vary from something like 30 million to over 100 million. So, um, you know, we, and then we, we don't really know how many animals are used in China, though we do have some estimates. But, you know, let's say 200 million. But if we're talking about vertebrate animals killed annually in food production, we're talking about something like 200 billion. So, a thousand times as many animals uh, used uh, and raised in food production. Now this figure includes fish raised for food production because they are vertebrate animals. It does not include wild caught fish. So it's just talking about animals that we are raising and that's significant because the animals we raise now overwhelmingly are very closely confined and it's not just the fact that they're killed, which might be the case with wild caught fish, um, that their lives are unaffected by humans until they're netted or hooked or whatever it might be, and then they generally have painful and drawn out deaths. But um, I'm not counting them, that would take the figure to um, probably over a trillion animals a year. But um, I'm talking about those who are raised in, in confined circumstances. So let's just look briefly at some of this. Um, and in particular, uh, we should be concerned about um, chickens, uh, because apart from the fish, they are the largest number of animals raised for food. And this is a quote from Professor John Webster, who was a veterinarian, uh, now emeritus professor at the University of Bristol, responsible for setting up a centre for uh, animal welfare that particularly focused on farmed animal welfare. And in his opinion, he says, the single most severe systematic example of man's inhumanity to another sentient animal is the chicken meat industry. So you know, occasionally, when I talk to people about animals, um, they say, oh, well, I don't eat red meat, as if somehow that's making an important step in reducing the uh, harm that they're causing to animals through their diet. If by not eating red meat, they're eating more chicken, then the truth is the reverse of that. It would be better if they continued to eat beef and stopped eating chicken. Uh, two reasons for that. One is chickens are much smaller, so they would be responsible for eating more chickens if they switch from eating beef to, uh, to eating chicken. And secondly, um, it would be generally true that chickens have worse lives. Shorter lives, of course, but worse, because beef cattle for at least a part of their life are going to be um, grazing in fields, 
Increasingly, unfortunately, we're bringing them into feedlots and feeding them on rain. Um, but chickens are indoors for their entire lives. And um, as well as being extremely crowded, as you can see here, they also have been bred to grow extremely fast, to have huge appetites and to grow very fast. So that today's chicken is ready for market in six to seven weeks. So they're essentially babies, but they're, but they're quite large. And that has a number of consequences. One consequence is that their leg bones are, have difficulty in supporting their weight. And that's what uh, one of the things that Webster was particularly thinking about. Um, because they bred to grow so fast, their bones have not matured. He says they are in pain for the last two weeks of their lives, simply standing up. Uh, and he's likened them to somebody with arthritis in their legs who is forced to stand up all day. Now you might say, why are the chickens forced to stand up all day? Why don't they just sit down? Well, one reason for that is that they would be sitting on their own droppings and the droppings of other birds who have been in this shed before. The shed is not cleaned out every six or seven weeks when the birds are taken out. So there's an accumulation of droppings. Um, chicken droppings are alkaline um, and when uh, they mix, when there's a lot of them and they mix with moisture in the air, um, they are so alkaline that if the chickens sit down on them, they will actually get uh, caustic burns on their thighs and, and on their breasts. So um, they're going to be in pain if they sit down or if they stand up. Uh, so that's, that's one problem that particularly troubled Webster. Uh, sometimes their legs will collapse under them. Here's an example. This is not the way a chicken would normally sit down with legs splayed out like this. This chicken, those uh, legs essentially have collapsed uh, under them um, and that's why they like that. Now, just go back to this slide. If the chicken is here, say, these long lines that you see are bringing food and water for the chickens, automated food and water supply systems. So if the chicken who you just saw, who can no longer stand up, is here, that chicken is going to die of dehydration or starvation. They're not going to be able to move to food, and nobody is going to notice that this has happened to them and either take them for uh, veterinary assistance, chicken producer would laugh at you if you said that, but it's not worth it. Um, uh, and in fact, they're not even likely to be able to notice it and walk through and, and wring their necks for the matter they're suffering. Um, that's partly because you know the, these chickens are so cheap because there's very little labour used, uh, and the, the workers who are being employed don't like to walk through the chicken houses, spend too much time in them. Um, and if you ever go into one, you know why. There's so much ammonia in the air from the droppings that it actually stings your eyes and throat when you go in there. Um, so you try and get out of it. Chickens don't have any choice. Uh, okay, I'll show you that. Um, this is the battery cage system for egg production. Um, again, extremely crowded. Uh, this is perhaps a fairly extreme example, but um, it certainly happens. I've seen uh, standard cages that should only has four birds per cage, housing um, five or six birds. Um, you can also see that uh, if you look at some of these more closely, um, this bird, for example, uh, her feathers have been rubbed off um, against the wire or against the other birds, uh, and um, the skin can get quite red and raw. So um, this is a miserable life for um, hens. But it's still allowable in Australia. The European Union uh, banned this as of 2012. So um, more than 10 years ago, this has been illegal in the United, uh, in, the, in the entire European Union. Um, a lot of people think we're somehow more advanced than countries in the European Union. You know, we're better about animals than Spain because, after all, Spain still has bullfights. We don't have bullfights. Yeah, but you know, how many bulls are killed in bullfights in Spain? I think. It may be 10,000 or it may be 20,000, um, compared to the hundreds of millions uh, of, of birds in the European Union, and say in Spain, tens of millions anyway, in Australia, um, tens of millions, maybe 20, 25 million um, hens laying eggs. So fortunately, not all in cages. Um, so you know, basically, we are treating animals worse than Spain because we still have uh, hens in cages. Some of you may have seen 
uh, news items recently that the government is going to phase it out. Um, anybody know, want to say when the government is going to phase it out? Did you notice that? Not the people from Animals Australia here. 36, somebody said? That's correct. 2036. Isn't that terrific, guys? Um, we need another 13 years to get rid of something that the European Union got rid of 10 years ago. So I don't think we can be particularly proud of um, our treatment of, of farm animals. Uh, okay, sow stalls. Um, we look at the pig industry. Um, the worst aspect of the pig industry is the fact that the breeding sows uh, individually stalled in, in many countries. Again, this is not this is banned in the European Union. It's banned in some states of the United States, including you know, California is the largest one. Um, but um, basically, it's still uh, predominant in the states in the United States where most pigs are produced, like Iowa. Uh, and um, it's uh, being phased out um, here, so I guess we're a little advanced. Uh, in advance uh, of the United States on that. Um, but in China, it's going ahead at a huge rate. China is now the world's biggest producer of pigs. And um, this is a huge high-rise piggery. China has uh, building multi-story, 26-story factory farms uh, now. Um, and if you look at this picture, it's kind of hard to see how, how many sows are there in these stores. It sort of just recedes into the distance there. So um, unfortunately, looking at it globally, and this is one of the things that I say about the new, uh, in the new edition in animal liberation now, that uh, really globally things have got worse for animals because when I first read animal liberation, China was a much poorer country than it is today and people could not afford much meat. So China was not producing very much meat. In those 50 years, China has become more prosperous, more people, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. That's a good thing, undoubtedly. Uh, but um, unfortunately, they are following Western patterns in eating more meat as they can afford to, and China is uh, going into factory farming in a huge way. So um, that's one respect in which we need to have a more global focus uh, if we're going to reduce animal suffering worldwide. Um, these are these are the pigs who are sold to market. The, the, the breeding sows we saw before. Um, their job is to produce more more piglets, um, and uh, these are the somewhat more grown grown on piglets uh, pigs who are going to be uh, then uh, slaughtered and sold to meat. As you see, they're also very crowded, um, and this is still likely to be happening here. They're um, indoors. Uh, they have little to do except um, occasionally they get something to eat uh, and otherwise they're just being fattened in these crowded conditions until eventually they get slaughtered. Okay, so um, one of the things that has happened I think since again since the first version of animal liberation is there is more understanding now of the fact that we need to move away from meat not only because of animal welfare, as I've been showing you, but also for um, health and environmental reasons. And this comes from, uh, this quote comes from what's called the Eat Lancet Commission. Lancet is, you may know, is one of the two leading medical journals in the world. Uh, it set up a commission to look at the impact of meat, both on, on the health of consumers and on the health of the planet. So the experts who wrote this report were either um, public health uh, experts on uh, the impact of diet or environmental experts. And they concluded that um, you see a diet rich in plant-based foods with fewer animal source foods confers both improved health and environmental benefits. Uh, and that's some hope that we are getting greater recognition of the impact of meat on climate change in particular, but also on local problems like local pollution issues. And the improved health is two aspects of it. One is um, they, and, and this report emphasizes this, that a diet high in meat is more likely to lead to cancers of the digestive system and to heart disease, which are the two 
major killers, uh, but also that there's a public health aspect, and that is that we um, are more likely to have uh, further pandemics uh, as a result of factory farming. Although the COVID-19 pandemic does not appear to have come from a factory farm, although it certainly did come from animals, whether from the Wuhan wet market or from the Wuhan uh, laboratory, we don't really know. But the previous pandemic, the swine flu pandemic of around 2009, did come from uh, factory farms with pigs. Uh, and many health experts have warned that factory farms are ideal place, places to, for viruses to develop, uh, to spread to many animals. You've seen how crowded the animals are, so they're easily going to spread. Because the animals are crowded, they're likely to be stressed and their immune system still could be weaker. And even if workers don't want to spend very much time in these unpleasant places where the animals are confined, they do have to go in there sometimes um, and they do have to move the animals out and to be slaughtered. And so the viruses will get a chance uh, to spread to humans as well. So there's that public health risk as well that is another important reason for uh, wanting to reduce meat consumption and phase out factory farming. And in terms of feeding the world, that's another important question. Um, it's interesting, before I go into the details of the slide, it's interesting that in the context of Russia's recent termination of the deal to allow grain to be shipped from Ukraine, um, the uh, assumption has been almost that without the wheat that Ukraine produces, the world is going to be short of food, that uh, people in Africa or the Middle East are not going to be able to get enough grain. Now, in fact, that's not the case because the world produces plenty of grain to feed people, but it feeds a large part of this grain to animals, and in the process, it wastes most of the food value of the grain. Um, and in saying this, I'm not in any sense, of course, defending what Russia is doing, either with its original invasion of Ukraine uh, or in now um, again blockading the ports uh, and uh, terminating the deal that allowed it to be exported. Um, Russia is simply quite cynically um, disregarding uh, the interests of, of others uh, for its own aggressive ambitions or Putin's own aggressive ambitions of making Russia great again as it was during the Soviet Union period and during the Tsarist period. So in no sense am I defending that. But, but it is still a fact if you look at this that um, we can get far more food value by eating plants directly than by eating meat. And uh, if you look at this, and you see soybeans are way up there. Um, but even the grains, rice, corn, and other le uh, legumes, sorry, uh, and then wheat, uh, produce more, not just more calories, but more protein, usable protein, per, um, per hectare than uh, all of the animal products, with milk down here, eggs and meat coming further down and beef coming further still. And yet despite this, um, something like 60% uh, um, of the corn or maize produced um, in the world is fed to animals. 77% uh, of soybeans, a particularly high protein crop, is fed to animals. And uh, about 20% of the world's wheat crop. So the world's wheat crop, if you just take wheat alone in the context of Ukraine, just to conclude that point, um, the world's wheat crop is about 150 million tonnes. Um, and if 20% um, uh, of that is, is fed to, um, is, is fed to uh, animals, then um, uh, you're, you're wasting the food value of that. And when you take the corn into account, uh, you're wasting the food value of um, hundreds of millions of tons of grain. Uh, Ukraine exports, uh, or exported during the past year before the blockade ended, about 30 million tons of wheat. So um, if we really want to feed the world, uh, if we 
we stopped feeding so many animals, so much grain to animals, we would have uh, an abundance of grain that we would, would be available for human consumption. So um, that concludes the slides. Um, let me just say one more thing uh, about the uh, difference in the, the new version of animal liberation now, and that is that obviously it gave me a chance to look at the progress that has been made and that can be made for animals. And uh, as you've seen from what I've been saying, if you look at the overall global picture, it's not really encouraging. Uh, and that is largely because of the presence of China. We are producing more animals than before. Um, but even in uh, countries outside China, uh, rising prosperity has still meant in many countries rising meat consumption. But on the other hand, the animal movement exists. Uh, it uh, is having an impact. As you saw that it's having an impact in the European Union. Um, it's having an impact in Australia, even if we're lagging behind in some respects. But um, after all, we're not reliant only on the government. Um, we are also able to make our own changes. And it's encouraging that uh, in supermarkets here, you can get um, eggs that are not from battery cages. Uh, they're well marked, um, free range or barn laid eggs. And in fact, Coles and Woolworths have agreed to phase out, I think Aldi too, am I right? Um, yes, the people from Animals Australia down here in Nottingham, um, have agreed to phase out the sale of um, eggs from cage pens um, in 2025, was it? Thank you, yes. So, uh, yes, the animal movement has been making progress, and we can thank Animals Australia and other organisations around for working for animals uh, in that way, uh, and that's something to build on. And that's something that I think people who want to be effective in reducing animal suffering, reducing suffering in general in the world, given the very large number of animals who are suffering, uh, ought to be supporting, uh, and uh, ought to be, that ought to be, and it is an important part of the effective altruism movement. Okay, so I think I've probably gone on uh, longer, longer than I should have, but um, I'll stop now, and we do have some time for uh, questions. Uh, yeah, so that, that is another difference between animal liberation now and uh, the earlier versions. Um, I didn't really think very much about the suffering of wild animals. I think I made a brief comment in earlier version that basically said um, we shouldn't interfere in nature because we generally make a mess when we do try to interfere with nature and things get worse. Um, and I think that's still a significant danger of that. And I think if you have a, the idea of trying to um, eliminate pain in animals, yes, you don't really know what the consequences of that would be. Um, uh, I, said, I guess you know, if you succeeded in doing it, then clearly there wouldn't be pain. And, that might be a good thing, but um, I mean, one consequence of a proposal like that is that you're immediately going to divide the animal movement from the environmental conservation movement, um, which will see value in the preservation of ecological systems that have evolved over millions or hundreds of millions of years. Uh, and you know, neither of those movements, I think, is so strong that um, we can say it doesn't matter if we don't work together. I think it's really important that we do work together. So my concerns for trying to reduce wild animal suffering would not be relating to those sorts of sweeping proposals um, or the or ideas that other people have said that we should eliminate predators because um, you know, predators cause suffering. Um, I think we should, if we're really concerned about wild animal suffering, the largest number of wild animals that we inflict suffering on, <coughs> again, is, is fish, because you know, most of the fish that we're catching in the ocean are wild animals, and uh, we are inflicting great suffering on them because there is really no humane slaughter for fish. There are some countries that are experimenting in electrical stunning for some fish that are caught in various ways, but, but you know, the vast majority of fish caught in the oceans are suffering, as I said, slow, lingering deaths. Um, 
So you know, let's let's campaign against phishing. That's one thing we could do. Um, other things you could do, where you'll certainly get support from the environmental movement, is uh, keep your cats indoors at night if you have cats, um, and uh, put bells on them if they're going outside at all. Um, those are going to help wild animals and reduce wild animal suffering. Um, and you know, actually, this was one of the things that always came up when I was involved with um, what's now Animals Australia. It was then the Australian Federation of Animal Societies. We had a group of different societies, and there were societies people specifically focused on cats. Uh, and uh, it was not easy to get them to uh, align always with the people concerned about wild animals, um, because many cat people would say, "Well, my cat doesn't kill." Um, but uh, there's been, there's, again, there's, there's good research on this now. I mean, people who've um, attached uh, mini, mini cameras, video cameras to cats who uh, go out at night, and it's pretty general that um, if you have cats outside at night, particularly, they will hunt and kill uh, birds and small rodents and so on. So, so that's another thing we could be doing. But I, I don't know that. You know, and there are other things you can think about installing uh, bird friendly glass is obviously going to help protect wild animals but, but the larger schemes I don't think we're, we're ready to do that yet. Yeah, it certainly seems like a lot of research to be done in any of those areas um, for the answer to that questions. Um, the next question is about um, insects. Um, you said that you're agnostic about whether insects suffer and the question is if there is that 1% chance that flies suffer surely we should act as if they do because by accidentally we could have an accident a huge um, uh, yeah, so again, there's, there's a practical issue that um, it's hard enough to get people to have sympathy for, let's say, chickens or fish. Um, it's hard, it can be harder still to get them to have any concern about flies. So um, in terms of actually running a successful campaign here, I don't think you're going to get very far um, campaigning for flies uh, or ants, uh, maybe. Um, I think there are some things that you perhaps could do. I've had some discussions with friends. Um, we don't really use fly paper very much as a way of uh, catching insects. We're much more likely to get out of the spray. But um, in some countries, and again in, in Asia particularly, people do use fly paper, which is a kind of you know, sticky paper that you hang around where the flies will be. And the insects, uh, flies and other insects, will get trapped on it, um, but not killed. So they will, if they can suffer, they will be suffering for a prolonged period while they try or fail to escape from the fly paper. So I think we can campaign against that, should that be around, should it be introduced. It's a little bit like uh, glue traps for, um, for mice or, or other rodents, which are also a very cruel way of killing um, rodents. And uh, again, you know, it's hard to get people to have sympathy for rodent, mice or rats, but um, we can at least talk about that we should find ways of killing them that kill them quickly. Uh, so we can do that, I think, for flies. But actually getting further and saying we shouldn't be killing them at all, I think is, again, the, the world is not ready for that. Yeah, definitely a practical difficulty there. Um, there someone has asked here, um, they've said that friends of theirs who are non vegan often ask, what should we do about all the animals that are currently in farms? And this person said they usually reply that this is this is an issue for smarter people than I can answer, and as a much smarter person than I, how do you this? Yeah. So the animals on farms are there because they've been bred, and they've been bred because uh, the breeders and the, uh, the producers um, believe that they will be able to sell uh, the products from those animals, whether it's uh, meat or the eggs or milk. And uh, if, in fact, everybody became vegan, then uh, obviously this would not happen overnight. We would have declining markets for these products and fewer of them would be bred. And eventually um, the producers would realize that there wasn't a market for them and they would cease to breed them. So it's, it's you know, we could, if, if really something did happen so that <coughs> producers were left with, with animals, they knew they couldn't sell. <coughs> well, I'm sure you get people who would say, look, we'll look after these, we'll make sure they don't breed any further, but this last generation will look after them and make sure that they can live out their lives and, and have a natural death. You know, maybe some people would want to keep some of them going, just as um, there isn't really an economic use for draft horses anymore, but there are some people who 
loved the big Clydesdales that uh, used to pull loads and they're, you know, they're not extinct as breeds, they're fanciers who keep them going in small numbers. I guess you could do the same for cows and pigs and chickens. Uh, yes, but um, I, don't, I don't think there's going to be a big problem really. Um, the way this, I hope, will happen, um, we'll simply have very small numbers to deal with by the time we get to most people being vegan. Mm, yes, and with the selected breeds will be Yeah, I think we shouldn't, uh, th this, this variety that we have now, we shouldn't um, actually keep them going. Um, so I think, you know, and there's, there's more suffering than I've even mentioned, and one reason why you shouldn't keep them going is, <coughs> think about this, they've been bred to have enormous appetites and to grow very fast. What about their parents? Obviously their parents have to have the same genes. But if you let their parents eat as much as they want, as we let the chickens who are going to be killed in six or seven weeks eat as much as they want, they would probably never survive to reproduce to sexual maturity, um, and if they did, they would be so large that they probably would never would not be able to mate. In fact, the standard turkey already can't mate because of its breeding. Standard like American turkey, they have for Thanksgiving with a huge breast, can't mate. They all have to be produced by artificial insemination. So, um, uh, you know, but that doesn't happen with chickens. It would be too expensive. There's too many of them to employ people to do the artificial insemination. So essentially they start, the, the parents of the chickens that you saw in that slide are really half starved all their lives. So that's another reason why you would want that particular type of breed of chicken mm. not to exist at all. Yes, yeah, so for sure. Um, the next person's asked that, you know, commented that veganism has reached the same sort of status as politics and religion has, and that's become very divisive amongst families and communities um, in the present day. And they're asking, in your opinion, why is it so polarized? Well, it's polarizing because there are people who have um, grown up eating meat um, and feel threatened by the idea that they should change. Um, they're threatened by the idea that, that means that what they've been doing for many years is wrong. I'm in that category, of course. I was 24 years old before I woke up to what I was eating and why. <coughs> um, but you know, maybe I have the excuse that at that time very few people talked about it. Um, you hardly met any vegetarians, let alone vegans. So. Um, uh, yeah, you, you, people, you, know, you make people feel guilty in a way as to what they're doing and they get defensive. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I've realised over, over the years is that it's really hard to change people's habits on something like me. Um, harder, as it turns out, than, for example, to change their habits about smoking, which is something where there has been a huge change over my lifetime. And compared with how it was when I was a student here at Melbourne University, and you know, you, you, you went to parties um, and you came home, took off your clothes, left them on the chair. The next morning you could s smell the cigarette smoke from the room where you were in because everybody was smoking inside. Um, doesn't happen anymore. So that's an interesting change. Uh, it would be great if we could make the same change with regard to meat, but um, of course people were motivated by fear of getting cancer in particular. Um, and that was a powerful factor. It was more clear cut the link between smoking and cancer more clear cut than the link between meat and cancer, although I do think there's a link. So, um, so it's just harder to shift uh, people's eating habits than I had realised. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the arguments that I found really compelling in the new edition of the book that I hadn't considered much before was around this um, the argument that often people are only to bring up and say, what can my individual difference make? Is this just a like drop in the ocean? And you mentioned a compelling argument based on uh, is expected value and how that can affect um, much larger change than we might think. I was just wondering if you could explain that a little bit. Yeah, sure. Um, so the argument essentially is um, if I decide I'm not going to eat meat, um, it doesn't make a difference because the supermarket that I shop at, assume I shop at a supermarket, um, is not so sensitive to one customer changing their purchases. You know, let's say, okay, so I don't buy one or two chickens per week that I used to buy, or you know, cuts of other animals. But um, a supermarket won't change its order for the, because it's dropped by one or two chickens. It'll only change it when it, let's say, drops by 100 chickens, then it might reduce the order. Um, so some people say, so I, I, don't, I can't make a difference, so why should I bother? But if you think about it, it can't really work exactly in, in that way that one person 
not buying makes a difference to the supermarket. But if 100 people don't buy it, then let's say the supermarket does reduce its order and that feeds back to the producers and there are fewer chickens, fewer chicks who are ordered um, and eventually you know, fewer chickens suffer. Now, um, you may not make a difference. Let's say there's only a one in a hundred chance that you will be the one who brings the purchase number of purchases below the threshold for the chicken for the supermarket to save it to reduce its chicken order. But if you are the one who is on the threshold, then actually it will be a hundred chickens that your decision uh, reduced in terms of the purchases from the supermarket, not just one. So. If you think about expected value, which means uh, the probabilities that you will be achieving something, the, the value of, of the change divided by the odds against you being responsible for achieving it, it works out to being the same kind of value as if each individual deciding not to order a chicken makes a difference. Because instead of having then the certainty that you've saved one chicken from going through this factory farm hell. You have a one in a hundred chance of saving a hundred chickens from going through this factory farm hell. Or maybe it's a one in a thousand chance of saving a thousand chickens, depending how coarse the ordering pattern is. But the expected value comes out the same. So I don't think the argument is a, a sound argument in terms of saying you can't make a difference. Um, we know that large groups of people must make a difference. That's the way the market has to work. So the, the odds are going to even out and be the same as if one person had a difference. Yeah, I found that really compelling when I was very interested in as someone who you know, wants to reduce the order from supermarkets, it still sometimes occurs to me that you know, I really don't actually make a difference because it's great to see it fleshed out. Um, the next question is in that factory farmed um, the cultural landscape that you have, that the animals have to endure. As well as the physical suffering, is there evidence that factory farm animals experience psychological suffering by human or in sort of similar conditions? Well, there's certainly evidence that they uh, experience uh, stress in various ways. Um, so, the chickens, chickens, for example, you know, let's put aside the question of the physical pain from the legs that Professor Webster talked about. But these chickens are extremely crowded, um, and chickens normally live in small flocks where they can identify each individual member of the flock. So whether the flock is 20, 30, or um, research has shown up to 90 birds, chickens will get to know every individual um, and they will get to know the pecking order, an expression that actually comes from people who observe chickens in a, in a flock. And um, the pecking order means the chickens know whether they are above or below every chicken they meet in the pecking order. That means do they have to yield to the chicken because they're below that chicken and that chicken will peck at them and be dominant over them if they try and take food that that chicken is aiming at getting? Or are they dominant over the chicken and they can continue to go for the food because that other chicken is below them in the pecking order and will know that it better not try and get the food that they're going for or they'll peck it? So, um, that individual recognition is part of a stable flock, which traditional farmers who have, maybe people who have backyard um, hens, would know about. But uh, you have 10,000, maybe 20,000 chickens in a single shed. Obviously, you don't get that. So you do get that psychological stress. The other thing that you're going to get with, um, with the mammals, pigs and cows, in particular, is uh, the fact that the mothers and their offspring are separated at an early age. Uh, you get that particularly in the dairy industry where cows have to be made pregnant every year to um, continue to produce milk um, and then the dairy producers will take their cow calves away from them just because they want to sell the milk, they don't want it to be drunk by the calf. So um, it's clear that, that cows miss their calves. So, and I talk about some anecdotes of farmers who acknowledge that the cow who passes the place where a calf was taken from her, even days or weeks earlier will still pause and look around and call for the calf um, that she's missing. Uh, and the calf, of course, well, the calf, if, if the calf is a male, is no use in the dairy industry, will probably be slaughtered at an early age for, for veal. 
um, and if the calf is female, will be brought up as a dairy cow, but will also miss her mother. So again, there's psychological stress going on there. Yeah. Um, one of the major chapters in the book is what we didn't touch on tonight so much is on animal experimentation within science and research. And someone here noted that the FDA recently removed the requirement in the US for drugs to be tested on animals before human clinical trials. And now they're kind of wondering what, given your knowledge of the animal experimentation, how significant of a development is that? Yeah, I don't think that that is a very significant development, unfortunately, um, because in fact the FDA was saying even prior to that that people did not were not required to experiment on animals. They were saying they could submit other data. But generally, the FDA was not accepting the other data as being of the same standard, as being sufficiently compelling to approve the products. So the companies wanting products to be um, approved by the FDA were still doing animal experiments. And I suspect that that situation isn't really going to change because of this law. Um, because the law just says they don't have to do animal experiments. It doesn't say that the FDA has to approve the non-animal experiments um, or regard them as being equally strong evidence. So I think it's going to take significantly more. You know, maybe, maybe this will produce a slight uptick in the number of uh, non-animal testing that's being done. I'm thinking of things like in vitro testing uh, uh, of products. But I still think it's going to be a long process. Uh, and I think we need more dramatic changes. And again, in the new edition I talk uh, and quite lots of people in the science community who acknowledge that generally the results of animal testing are not translatable to humans. Uh, it's not that they're zero value, but very often they're not. And even a past director of the National Institutes of Health, the biggest US government research institution, says that there's a need for change, says we were very good at curing cancer in mice, but it hasn't really helped us in curing cancer in humans. Um, but he only came to that realisation after he'd been director of NIH. We need somebody who has still got the power to make those changes to go along with that. Um, and we haven't got there yet. Uh, and as I said, uh, animal research in China is continuing is to increase. And uh, there are very low standards of animal welfare scrutiny there. It was one of the most, um, I sort of forgotten about from where the first edition of the book got on the sort of first things is that non transferability between animals and humans. And by the way, as you're recommending the new book, uh, we should mention that the book is going to be available um, uh, after we finish, um, and I'll be happy to sign copies if anybody would like them to. Yeah, absolutely. We've got one final question, and then we will get on to the um, book signing process, and that is around the existence of zoos and whether or not they are justified. Do animals in zoos suffer like physical? Um, well, I think we should replace zoos with sanctuaries for um, animals who are presently in zoos because um, you know, unlike the, the question about farmed animals that you mentioned, it's somewhat different in that there are, um, there are animals in zoos who um, we could not return to the wild and they lost the skills that they would have needed to survive in the wild. Um, and in some cases, we don't want to, you know, we could simply have them in sanctuaries and not allow them to breed. So that would be one option. And I think where the animal is not uh, endangered in the wild, that probably is the best option. But um, there are other animals of species that are endangered in the wild and are losing habitat. And um, again, you know, there are conservationists who will want to preserve the species, and I can understand the reasons for doing that. So I think there what we need is not zoos, but sanctuaries, where I, by which I mean the primary aim should be to give the animals a good life, to enable them to develop and retain the skills that they would have in the wild, and to have the kinds of social groups and social organizations that they would have in the wild. It's possible that humans would be able to see the animals in these sanctuaries, but the sanctuary shouldn't be designed primarily so that humans can see animals, but rather primarily so that the animals can have good lives. And if, you know, as a byproduct of that, humans want to go and see them, fine, I don't have any objection to that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense.
Um, that's unfortunately all the time we have for the Q&A. Can everyone please thank, I'm joining, thank you for your